In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I was commenting the other day with somebody that kids, you know, young people, all the way up until about high school, are having a rough go of it lately. They are really being made fun of and roasted everywhere. Because it seems that people forget that we were young once, and I use the word young in quotation marks whenever I speak of myself, because people always just say, well, you're just always young. But we're picking on them because we forget some of the crazy things that we did as kids and young adults. The problem is, though, is that now it's all public. It's all online. And so the things that kids are being asked to do are not just sometimes crazy and even dangerous, but they're being asked to upload them to the internet so that other people can see them and imitate them. So if you don't know, there are these things called different challenges. So for example, there's something, you know, not too bad but still dangerous called the cinnamon challenge, where you try to swallow a whole spoonful of cinnamon. I don't recommend it. All the way up to something that is downright dangerous, which is the latest one, where people are stepping out of slow-moving vehicles to do a dance in front of somebody who's filming it and then they upload it. I have to admit, I confess, I have laughed at some of the outtakes. <laughs> but as I said before, we have to remember that every generation does things like this. And perhaps some of you were some of those people who dyed a blonde streak in their hair, or swallowed a goldfish whole, or tried to cram 15 people into a VW Beetle. You know, uh, I see the laughter on that one, yeah. So it's a challenge, is what they're trying to step up to. Now St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians today, he's talking about a different kind of challenge. Because the challenge that he's laying down to these Christians in the church of Ephesus, this Greek area, is to be imitators of Jesus Christ to try to be as Christ-like as possible. And he gives a list of several things that they should be doing. And if you look at this list, it's not anything that's out of this world. It's the simple, everyday things. Putting away falsehood. Speaking the truth to our neighbors. Being angry but not sinning. Giving up stealing. Not letting evil talk come out of our mouths or onto our phones or keyboards or wherever else we might be putting evil words. So these aren't really pie-in-the-sky things. But I think it still presents a challenge to Christians everywhere because we're tempted more than anyone to forget about kindness. And kindness is one of those things that holds churches and families and societies together. And when we begin to forget kindness, well, we can see all that evidence around us in our world. That word imitation, though, kind of has a negative connotation. When I think of the word imitation, I think of my friend who got that wonderful deal on a Rolex on a street in New York City. Fifty bucks. <laughs> wonderful. The only problem is it was spelled R-O-W-L-E-X. <laughs> so when we think of imitation, we think of that. But that's not what Paul is telling us to do. Paul is telling us that we should be so imitating Christ that when people see us, they think it's Him. That we put Christ on so much as our clothes that when people see us, they think it's him. Many people who went through the inquirer's class I did a couple years ago probably remember this, but I said, why does the priest wear so much clothes? To which one person responds, because he has to look pretty. <laughs> and I always say it can be a both and, but that's not the exact answer. The answer is, is so that when you see this, if you were to just put a hand over my face and my hands, 
It's Christ. I'm trying to stand in His person to proclaim the gospel and to celebrate the sacraments. And each one of us can try to stand in our own lives in His person as well. But now there's something about those challenges, though, that bother me more than the whole, you know, just as much as the whole dying thing. And that is they're all about me. If you look at those challenges, they're all about drawing attention to oneself. It's about me. It's about what I look like I'm doing. It's about how many subscribers or clicks that I can get on that video. The Christian life is the exact opposite. It's not about us. It's about Christ and our neighbor. Because the moment that church or life or holiness or anything becomes about us or about me, we failed. Because as we said in the song, all the glory is supposed to go to God. All the glory of what we do, even the kindnesses that we do, are supposed to go to God Himself. And it's easy for a church to kind of fall into this trap to think that holiness is about sitting very solemnly in a pew, keeping our hands together like good altar servers. I think they're doing it. Okay. You know. And thinking that that is the definition of holiness. Holiness is putting on Christ. So how do we do that in our daily lives? Well, right now we're getting back to school season. Yes, Lord, thank you. I am not the only one doing that, okay? Trust me. But we're getting back to that back to school season. So to all the students out there, I remind you not just to be kind to your teachers and to love them, but to also be kind to your fellow students. Be considerate to that new kid who doesn't know anybody in the school. Be kind to that new person you're sitting next to if they forgot something like a pencil or a piece of paper. Parents, be kind to that parent who doesn't know the procedures for picking their kid up in the school line. Yeah, we're laughing at that one too because it's true. Right? Kindness can be so many different things. And in a church, imagine if each one of us dedicated ourselves each week to finding one more act of kindness to do just for one another in our community. It might mean looking at the directory, at those people we know who are shut in, giving them a call, just to see how they're doing. It might mean finding some of the people in our congregation who can't mow their lawns anymore, or may need a little bit of extra help, and saying, you need somebody to volunteer. It can be almost anything. Finally, when we begin to put on Christ so much, that people see Him instead of us, we'll receive our reward. There was a man who I met who uh, he loved to volunteer in hospitals. And because he, he was retired, he had all kinds of, of time. And what he would do is he would go around as a volunteer in the hospital, and he would do all the little things that sometimes kind of get lost in the mix. He would sit with people who were sick, and he would read to them so that they heard a voice that wasn't just the TV on all the time. He would also, when the food came and maybe that person couldn't open some of the food, he would open it for them to, to make sure that they could actually eat. He would sit with people who couldn't talk anymore, couldn't move anymore, who were dying to make sure they didn't die alone. And one time a lady who was kind of, you know, short-sighted and maybe couldn't see very well. She says, anybody ever told you you look like Jesus? And he said, I can assure you I don't. But I'm trying. So that's my challenge to all of us. Can we think of at least one or two more pieces of kindness, acts of kindness that we can share with one another? and then come back and see exactly what effect it has on our community. So that when we finally meet Christ, and we see Him face to face, He'll say to us, it's like looking in a mirror. Amen.